All right, welcome everyone to our panel today. We are gonna be talking about data management, including cloud analytics and AI, and we're gonna cover all of those topics comprehensively in 40 minutes. Or at least that's what these guys are telling me. We have a great panel for you today. Uh, first, we have Bill Almert. He's an engineering fellow with uh, GD Mission Systems. Welcome, Bill. We also have Bob Ritchie, who is the Vice President of Multi-Domain Operations at Lidos, and uh, Chad Hofferbeer, VP of Multi-Domain Uh-oh, I mixed you guys up. Chad is the VP of Multi-Domain Operations at Lidos, and Bob is the VP of Software at SAIC. Chad, of course, just leaving us from RCO and uh, doing some great work on the other side. So we're gonna warm these guys up very briefly. Uh, as quick as you can, something that the audience doesn't know about you. We'll start with Bill. As a software developer, I love my keyboard. I've been carrying around the same keyboard for 20 years, and I've had to rehab it three times because you just can't buy them anymore. I'd love to see what TSA says when he brings that through. Bob, how about you? Um, something most people might not know. Uh, many years and many pounds ago, I was a Division I college basketball player. Awesome. Uh, things someone might not know about me is that I've, I've coached hockey for about 25 years, all age groups from U8, which I'm doing right now, so learn to skate uh, all the way up to college. All right, awesome. So that's, that's where you get that, that hip check, move those roadblocks from hockey. All right, wonderful. Well, we're really glad to have you guys here. Um, lots of topics. We'll jump right in. Um, so Bill, we're going to start with you. Can you share with us what are the biggest data management challenges that you see in the DoD and how do you see us getting after them, or where do you see us not getting after them so much? So that's interesting. So data management, uh, I've been doing for a long time, actually. Um, data is interesting, and as we interconnect the systems more and more, because you keep hearing how we need to move from linearly, vertically integrated systems into the more dynamically web-connected systems, it's all good. There's a lot of data there, but what we don't need to do is move all the data. What we need to do is actually turn the data into information. So not every system needs every piece of data, and God knows not every person can deal with every piece of data. So you actually have to figure out what data is important, how to extract the value of it, and then how to get it where it needs to go, both for machines to act on and then for humans to act on. I see a bunch of things happening you know, with ML, with AI, you know, very task focused, which is appropriate given where the art of the it is today, where we're looking to take and do task extraction and then work that. I see work happening in the development of the networks that are going to scale and be resilient and dynamic to the environments. Um, the I, I do see a little bit of a gap in terms of closing between understanding what information should go over what networks in what conditions. It, it's a hard problem, and it's going to be a problem that doesn't have a static answer. It's going to have a changing answer as missions change, as capabilities change. So there's a, there's a hard nut to crack there. All right, and we'll talk about one of your favorite topics a little later on the panel, multi-level security. I know it's also your favorite term. Um, so Bob, same question to you. Um, can you share just some of the biggest challenges that you see, but, but give us a little bit. You guys have a defense side. You have a commercial side. Um, let me know kind of how you're applying the commercial lessons learned to the DOD. Sure, yes. Uh, so a lot of what we see in terms of data management in the commercial side and starting to penetrate uh, into the DOD side and, and even federal civilian government agencies has to do with data-centric security, attribute-based access control to enable uh, some MLS capabilities. And some of the barriers there are, ha are historically have been access to infrastructure and technology enabling solutions that get you to where you need to get to that warm, fuzzy comfort level of your data is going to be secure and maintain security posture. Uh, and you know the legacy castle and moat security model in and around data that, that some federal government agencies still have, uh, but commercial has, has been moving away from. So as we see the, kind of that, that kind of shell being broken and mo moving more to a data-centric, zero-trust security model, uh, you start to see opening doors and breaking down these data silos where instead of sneaker netting flat files around every night to, to stay in sync across you know, da multiple data centers or even multiple systems within a data center, you start to see the ability to move towards data lake and delta lakes 
uh, and, and really now the, the new what fad, uh, lake house, right? So you have the warehouse capabilities and data lake capabilities. So uh, I see that as the trend of where we're going. Uh, as far as what's been an impediment to in, in, in the challenges around that is uh, really data discovery. In and out. A lot of people don't know the data that they're holding in their own database and how redundant it is with the, the mission sitting right next to them. Uh, so there's a whole level of portfolio rationalization and data discovery that I think is, is also a part of the, the overcoming the next challenge. Right, absolutely. So Chad, we're gonna, we're gonna bring on a war fighting lens here. You just came out of RCO. You've been doing a lot of work on getting data to airmen at the tactical edge. How, how do we make sure that our airmen at the tactical edge have all of the data to, that they need to have a consistent operational advantage? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we know the tactical edge is gonna have probably uh, disrupted comms. Uh, we cannot fool ourselves into think that we'll have ubiquitous communication capabilities, especially at the tactical edge. And then there's also going to be those swap requirements that are you know, so near and dear to all of our hearts in the Air Force. So one thing that I'm very excited about over at Lidos is they've really invested internally to demonstrate something they call edge to cloud, which, which what we did was we teamed with companies like Amazon and Microsoft to build a heterogeneous cloud capability to put processing as, further, as far out to the edge as we, could, as we can. Because we know we're not going to have those, those ubiquitous comms back to operational C2 centers, we want to be able to best position our airmen at the tactical edge to be able to leverage what cloud capability they could have to make the best decisions and best operations possible. Do you want to share any technical details on that solution with the audience, or you want to keep it, keep it up here? We'll keep it high level, but uh, I've got a couple cards left. All right. Sounds good. Uh, so, Bob, how do we also solve this problem, uh, recognizing that we have to do this with our coalition partners? We have to be able to do cloud and edge, hybrid cloud, secret rel with our partners. Well, so the original question, too, around how does commercial do this, right? Because there's a lot of interoperability across commercial space. Uh, you know, my background is in somewhat in the fintech space. And so when you think about both the federal government integration with banking and with credit card market, the ability to protect and private citizens' data is the same there. So that same technology can translate over in terms of uh, dynamically and uh, every transaction enforcing you know, the software-defined policy to get that data-centric security. So solutions like Apache Accumulo or the commercial product on top, Coverse, uh, solutions like Apache Kafka and the commercial on top, Confluent Kafka, have really nice baked-in attribute-based access controls to start to enable these logically defined enclaves even in physically co-located or same enclave located. So you can run a cloud-hosted environment, a cloud in a box using Outposts and, and uh, Microsoft Stack Edge, and still have a full secret rel, secret, and even secret SAP all in one box or in a Conus Cloud environment without having to have independent systems uh, at each level. Right, so I have to tell the audience, I did not pay these guys in advance to relate all of their uh, answers back to zero trust and how <laughs> we're going to get after security of our data, um, but well done. Um, Bob, we're going to stay with you. Um, so Cloud One, we've been pretty aggressive. We'll probably get more aggressive. Um, what changes have you guys made over the last year, um, and where are we going next? So the past year, there's, there's been two really main changes. One ties to the previous panel that was up here and enabling access to economy of scale digital engineering tools. So whether that's Teamwork Cloud, Siemens Team Center, AFSIM, the, the tools that are needed to do digital engineering and then tying the digital engineering thread to the operational data thread to enable AI ML is the other advancement. So the, the emergence of a Cloud One data lake archetype was new about 16 months ago and now starting to get adopted beyond just the cyber defense posture, now CBM Plus just recently going live in Cloud One to do predictive maintenance for logistics IT. Uh, so being able to model in a data lake within Cloud One has been a huge enabling technology. And because they're sitting front row, I'll give a shout out to the Bespin team as well as an example of second order effects. It's not all about, hey, Cloud One is, is the end all be all answer. Cloud One is an enabling technology for partners like Bespin and others who are running software factories within Cloud One uh, and they were one of the few who've actually obtained their own continuous ATO with pure cloud CSP native capabilities. So that's a real economy of scale model that's at, seamless to, to adopt and support in day two operations. So the more we moving forward into the future of how can we accelerate that change for the, the additional, the, the, the further push, representing that federated model 
in a broad scale. So being able to take on multiple software factories, having multiple deployment engines that are accredited at the mission-specific level, uh, so to the point Bill made earlier, being able to tie a mission thread to a capability as opposed to having a one-size-fits-all enterprise solution. All right, thanks for that. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give us a little, a little credit for a second and just share that um, the Department of the Air Force, we still are the world's largest cloud instance in Cloud One. Uh, between that and Office 365, um, just it, our stats are pretty insane uh, for, for one enterprise. Um, but we're, st we're still really slow. We're still too slow getting our applications in the cloud. We have too many barriers. We're not making it as consumable as we need to be. We still have a lot of manual process. We're doing a lot of great things. We got a lot of great services. We still have a lot of way to go. Yes, ma'am. If you had a wild CIO um, basically say, guys, we're getting all of our unclassified stuff at least into the cloud by the end of 2023, the end of 2024, how, how, would you, how would you answer that challenge? So I think uh, a part of it is exercising some of the, the opportunity that's already there to do portfolio level rationalization. So it, I know in, in many pockets it's already been done, but not so much. It's been, it's been done around a data, con data center consolidation mindset. So really being able to identify those pockets of redundant data sets, uh, redundant systems that were maybe 90% the same as all the other systems that were there, but my, maybe had a bespoke part for a specific platform. And rationalizing that data and getting it represented in a cloud-centric data lake, and specifically, specifically a CONUS cloud-centric data lake from that standpoint when we're talking the unclass side. Um, the, the other kind of key accelerator to that is Cloud One's advancement in modularizing its inheritable ATO. And so that's, that's an area that for the past six months has been a high focus, and we continue to focus on moving forward so that the guardrails are less rigid and a little more a la carte so that it can be actually tailored to a risk profile of the specific mission instead of a one-size-fits-all. I think both of those two are critical. And then as we look beyond unclass, I think a, a DO, if I, you know, CIO for the day, pushing for a DOD-wide approval of a diode in both the, the main two cloud providers at the higher classification level is going to be imperative for bringing that up to the, the class level. I think there would be partying in the streets on that one. <laughs> So, um, Bill and Chad, we're going to shift gears to AI, the big bucket, the big overused bucket of AI here in a moment. But before we go there, do you all want to make any comments on uh, our, our cloud approach, Secret Rel, Tactical Edge, anything that we missed that you want to get in? You can also pick door number two, straight to AI. All right, we've selected door number two. All right, uh, so we're gonna go back to Bob for a minute. Um, and again, I apologize to the technologists in the audience for the way that we're using the term AI right now. Just, just kind of go with us. Um, so uh, Bob, what are the key attributes that AI needs to ease adoption? And especially in the DoD where we're not gonna have, at least in the next couple years, we're not gonna have thousands and thousands of data scientists um, you know, coming through our doors, we'd like that. Um, but that's not our reality at this point. Um, how do we ease adoption? And do we need to train more data scientists? Do we need to have better software that better leverages AI? What's your perspective? So I, I think it's definitely a mix of both. Um, it, but more so than anything else, and just tying back to Bill's original answer from the first question, tying AI to not be this, this sought after general AI approach, but making it actually prioritized mission need is gonna ease adoption because instead of peanut butter spreading AI across everything equally, you can focus on what's the, gonna get, drive the highest mission impact. Uh, how do you pick what's gonna drive the highest mission impact? That ties back to the previous panel, being able to model and simulate, what if I had this decision speed? What if I had this data to make this decision speed? Can then help you prioritize where you put your energy in terms of training models. Uh, to the workforce side, there are enabling technologies, uh, Databricks, DataIQ, some really great the COTS products that make it a little more approachable, uh, but yeah, and then just investing back into the, the you know, college education system and, and uh, even trade you know, education system within the country, I think will be huge in terms of impact as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just share as an aside. Um, so we launched Digital U. I know you guys are aware. Um, another shout out to the Bestman team for their great work on that. Um, but we've actually seen some pretty incredible results um, just having folks go in and learn via uh, via those tools, especially with Udacity, um, 
just people people are learning so quickly and they're applying it to their mission. It's been awesome. So I'm excited that we are providing more access to our airmen, including those that we did not hire for this purpose. Um, we've had um, we've had chiefs, we've had maintenance guys, um, we've had all sorts of um, folks that didn't see themselves as technical jump in and um, and just really do incredible things for their mission. So it's it's exciting times that we can we can leverage uh, the power of open source and relatively less expensive um, learning platforms these days. Um, I want to go over to Chad. How can we work with industry to accelerate getting that trusted data to the warfighter leveraging AIML? Yeah, as, as we all know, there's, there's no independent success in this game. So it's going to take tight partnership. Um, and, and what we need to do, in my mind, is build the data model pictures early before we get to the tactical edge. We, we need to exercise the models with the robust software capabilities, as mentioned, so that we have confidence to allow the operator on the loop at the edge to, to leverage those AI ML techniques. Um, but also, we need to, to, to test those systems and inject false data, because we know that that's going to be a threat out there. And we need to make sure that we can audit those outcomes so that the, the system responds in the way we want. So in terms of starting early, that's very big. But also, how do we acquire? Are we acquiring things um, in, in the best, most efficient way? Uh, it's going to take maybe a, 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 some shifts. And I will say that the Air Force is, is maybe leading the charge in how, we, how, we, how they change, how they acquire systems, and how they can bring AI ML. Because obviously, open architecture uh, principles are so important to be able to rapidly ingest uh, new data feeds as well as AI ML uh, solutions. So, I, I really applaud the, the airmen and guardians that I've seen over, the, over many years. I, I think they're leading the charge, and, and we need to certainly support their efforts. Our airmen and guardians are always leading the charge. We've got some incredible people. All right, so Bill, any advice on the right way to introduce AIML into decision processes or, in general, to, to leverage this technology for our mission? Yeah, so I'll, I'll actually build on what Chad said for a second. So. In terms of getting these things operationally employed, I think a big part of it that we don't necessarily think about a lot is that there are common problems that keep recurring in slightly different data sets, right? And so if you take kind of a, a general platform framework engine approach to it where you can have set playbooks for how you take data and say, oh, this problem's kind of like that one. Let me try this formula and see what comes out the other side. I think that's going to be pretty helpful in helping at scale, because we're not going to make 100,000 people that know what neural network structure to pick and how to tune the variables and have the access to all the things they need to make that work. So, so I got to tell you a story. Mm -hmm. We actually had an airman do just that. Um, this is one of the cool, uh, I, shameless, shameless plug for, for Digital U, but we, we literally had an airman who was just going through a module uh, on neural networks. Mm -hmm. We have this partnership up at MIT. Uh, it's an AI accelerator. We're working with you know 50-pound brains, PhDs, and AI ML. And we have our airmen up there, generally at the captain and major level, and then of course working with some of the best companies in Boston to, to work dual-purpose uh, cases. Um, some pretty cool things like um, speech to text using military and emergency responder speech with lots of static. That's actually a really difficult problem. Uh, predictive maintenance, you know, lots of different things. Uh, but we had an airman that was going through a module. M the uh, MIT guys had been stuck for about four weeks on an issue with a neural network. And one of our captains rolls up the next day and says, guys, I figured it out. And he goes and fixes the neural network. So th that might be the only example I can give to refute that uh, statement. But, oh, but I was pretty proud of that. I was pretty proud of our airmen. And MIT was like, oh my gosh. These airmen and guardians are pretty daggone smart. It's a beautiful thing when it happens. I love it when it happens. And I've seen it before. Um, but so if you take the approach, though, where you're only going to have a handful of people who can do that, and maybe we have thousands, that would be amazing. Um, part of the other gap is how do you take these things and actually get them not just to a test lab, but into operations, right? The, the jump from the lab to through operational testing and chop over that. That's something that, I mean, I see that on the software side. I see it also equally on the, the AI and ML side. It, it, there's, a, there's a chasm to cross there, and it's a pretty big one. Um, I think one of the ways we'll cross it and we'll get things 
integrated in more is, if you look at where the state of AI and ML are today, ML being a subtype of the broad family of AI techniques, um, you know, you can do a lot with ML. What we can do with ML on a day-to-day -day basis grows by leaps and bounds. It's pretty amazing. The, the amount of compute available, the amount of just experience people have grows a lot. The question is, what risk are you willing to accept in its employment? And the more risk you're willing to accept, the further you can go down the pipeline. So I, I personally think that starting with things that are for human attention direction, right? Like filter data and look at these 10 things, not the 10,000, right? Or things like that and start to generate the models and generate the trust, especially as these things become dynamic systems and we can push new capabilities very flexibly and quickly, you're going to need some flexible amount where the human says, I'm willing to let you do this, but not that, right? And, and work that through over time. So I, I might scare part of the audience with this question. But as I, as I work with, um, with our innovators, and, and especially our folks that, that have been kind of at the software deployment quickly to the warfighter game for a while, you know, we can now deploy code about 40 times a day, which is pretty good given the state of our infrastructure. Um, and we've come up with pretty creative models for how we can accredit software um, when you're leveraging an approved CI-CD pipeline. Um, we've had some success with CDSs. It's still one of the biggest problems, and I, I raise this every day, actually, with DOD, CIO, and DISA, and um, we have a coalition going. I hope it's faster than I think it will be, but um, we do have a lot of folks really focused on that right now. Um, but the big thing, the big nut that we just really have not been able to crack is on the OT side. Um, we've even been able to automate a lot of the DT. You know, just the CI/CD pipeline handles a lot of things. There are a lot of really great tools. But on the OT side, you know, for good reason, we have to know that our stuff works. I mean, we're, we are doing a combination of kinetic and non-kinetic effects that, that could matter a lot. You have to really be solid. But how, how close do you think we are to doing a better job of automating some of those tasks or leveraging AI? And what do you think we should be thinking about now uh, to get there? Because that is that, that final piece of speeding capability to the warfighter that we just were, were pretty nascent. Hmm. I wish I had a good answer to that one. Well, and you can, you can phone a friend too. Yes. So, so I certainly don't have all the answers, but one recommendation is that we start to collect more data from large force exercises and use that as OT opportunities. We, st we, we can do a better job of collecting data when we're doing large force exercises and other exercises to use those opportunities for OT events. And then we can start to use AI ML algorithms to optimize the, the way we use that data moving forward. Right now, I think a lot of data hits the floor that could add value and, and shorten schedules. I, I appreciate that perspective. I, th I think you're right. And um, I think there are some places where maybe we could use some robotic process automation, even some of the capabilities that we have today toward that use case. So we may, we may follow up on that. So uh, we have been talking around zero trust and multi-level security throughout the entire panel. We're going to focus in a little bit um, on that topic. Um, I will share with you and with the audience just as context. Um, I am incredibly heartened by the level of support that we are getting right now from our senior leaders, from Congress, uh, across the entire department uh, regarding zero trust. And the investment is, is actually flowing pretty readily. If I, if I read the tea leaves correctly, this is an area where IT is going to be toward the top uh, of the pile in priority for what we fund for the future fight. Um, so that is awesome. And especially as a CIO, it just makes me smile. Um, but what do we mean in the department when we say zero trust? Um, so in general, we leverage the, the Gartner maturity model, um, and we tend to talk in five lines of effort. Uh, one of those is uh, identity, uh, ICAM, um, and we have efforts ongoing for that. Zero Trust Gateway, um, we are largely looking at CNAP, but also working with DISA and others to vet different solutions. We're looking at Endpoint, um, and ITAS Wave 1 should be released anytime, and uh, we hope. And uh, that will play into our Endpoint strategy, SD-WAN. Um, and I'm trying to think what the fifth one is. 
when I remember, I'll tell you. Um, so let's let's go over to you, Bob, just as just as context um, on how we are getting after this. Um, so so Bob, multi-level security, obviously zero trust. However, we want to put this is really important to JADC2. It's really important to sharing data with our partners and allies. I would like us to get to a world where, at the very least, we can be fighting on one secret war fighting network with our joint partners and allies, where we can be sharing data seamlessly, where we have software that works, where we can deploy algorithms to back that software just with an incredible amount of speed, where we can achieve true decision advantage. Um, so what, what do you see in all of that as, as the primary challenges as we're trying to do this, especially with regard to how we do this at the tactical edge? Sure, so um, first and foremost, I think the, a, a data management solution that is, we'll, we'll just take the, the secret rel, secret sap, secret example, a, a PL3 or even PL3 plus, like if you're looking at PL4 rated uh, data management solution. So letting your data be co-located and logically segregated to a, a, a level that's sufficient to meet policy and, meet, and ensure that the data is gonna be properly protected, but be able to be co-located. And the reason why that's so important uh, is exactly what you're saying, the cost of maintaining in number of networks at the tactical edge is extrapolated. It's one thing to do it in a CONUS cloud and be able to you know, logically segregate VNets and VPCs and, and Google projects, no problem. Uh, but then you push that to 50, 60, 100 austere locations and the problem is now exponentially larger. So the ability to, uh, to get to a point where all that data can be physically co-located but logically segregated is an important step to get across. Uh, then when you start talking about WAN and SD-WAN, uh, how do you attack that problem to then make the CONUS Cloud, OCONUS Cloud, and Tactical Edge eventually consistent, for one, so not all the data everywhere, to Bill's point earlier, uh, not pushing everything everywhere, but you certainly want your CONUS Cloud to get to a point where it eventually has all the data for the, the purposes Chad just mentioned, to be able to then obfuscate, redact that data, run exercises, engage with Silicon Valley, engage with universities to do unclass level experiments on operationally realistic data. Um, but the ability to have SIFC solutions over the WAN that can peer back in to gates and cages that get you to that CONUS cloud or those OCONUS boxes downrange uh, to create really a data mesh that gets you the right data that you need for your mission threat at the edge. All right, thanks, and, and thank you also. You reminded me there that I forgot the most obvious one of the five uh, zero trust uh, pillars, and that is the data tagging, getting our data ready to actually work in this future environment. Um, so Chad, I, I'd love for you to expand on what we just heard, um, especially with regard to how industry can help. Um, and you're welcome to, to leverage past experience or current experience. Um, but how can we get after this to, to truly enable multi-domain operations? Yeah, so I, I, it's very important and I'm passionate about how we can leverage data for operational advantage. I, I've, I've told people the story. Of, I've worked at the RCO. I love that place. It's, it's a second home to me. I saw really cool stuff but I will tell you that I don't think we're gonna have another generational leap ahead in tech, in traditional tech, um, to position our nation where it needs to be uh, in, in kind of the more physical sciences. I think data is the future, and I think that is, we need to commit ourselves and invest wisely to commit ourselves to, to seizing all the opportunities that we're discussing up here on the table. So, so what I would say is, in terms of the partnership between industry and government, we can look at, at new ways of, of how do we do RMF, how do we do ATO, how do we do ATC? Does it have to be so binary? Can it be a, a scaled, a weighted approach to how we ingest data and how we, how we connect systems? And I'm, I'm excited about finding ways to speed capability to the field and, and testing and training on it in, 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 in parallel to, to fielding it so that we can then graduated maybe up to a higher level of trust, um, but it is important that we that we find ways to push to push capability to the field as quickly as possible. So I'm I'm betting that RMF or whatever it becomes in the future um, becomes significantly easier in this environment, um, and that quite frankly most of the RMF reform efforts that are underway today will be completely irrelevant as we move to actual consistent infrastructure that works, um, enterprise services. I mean, we, we make these things so hard. So we, we uh, if you all haven't met him, uh, we have an incredible new CISO, Aaron Bishop, who is all over this for us. 
Um, and then, of course, some great partners here trying to help us move forward as we get after our digital infrastructure and simplify that baseline um, to drive mission effect and make some of the uh, bureaucracy a little bit less painful. Um, but Bill, I know you're, you're super passionate about this topic. Um, we'll, we'll let you jump in with whatever you want to contribute. So whenever MLS comes up, it, it usually turns into about a three-hour conversation because whatever somebody says, whenever they say that, it means something different. So we have 10 minutes and 12 yeah. seconds. Roger. So um, the important thing is figuring out what you want to do with your data, right? Who are your actors? What are you doing to the data? Who are your data owners? What data flows do you need? What kind of flexibility do you need? These are all the things that become important because you actually, in any system I've ever seen, need a mix of different security affordances and architectures. Sometimes you need a true MLS component that is able to take data, manage it in a fine-grained way, process it in a trusted environment so that I can have secret and top secret users and top secret compartmented users all in the same system, all seeing the same secret data. And sometimes I, it's okay to have a guard that lets you know a partner in to see certain data and I, I release it out very specifically. Sometimes you need to come up with rules about what I can do. And so a, a lot of, I think what sits in front of us is, is decisions about you know getting away from historically what I've seen, which is we either share it or we don't. And if you share it or you don't, you get into this interesting situation where you're worried about somebody reverse engineering something about your system that's really important. Well, what, what if I could share a, a particular view that was enough for you know a good day, but on a bad day, I could share more, right? And, and to kind of come up with flexible ways to build systems to allow that to happen. And that's not gonna be any one specific architecture. That's gonna be a, a large scale system design that'll give us more flexibility um, much more quickly. And I think it's a flexibility we have to put in the hands of the commander not you know a policy decision that gets made and then it's locked for the next 20 years. All right, so we are just speeding right on through. I think we, we might actually get through some of our planned topics by the end of the 40 minutes. Um, I wanna come up a level for a minute and, um, and then we can dive back into any of the topics that we want to, but what would you say are the biggest things that, that I as the, as the CIO need to keep my mind on over the next year and you can, you can chat about key threats, um, key challenges, maybe even things that maybe that I don't see coming. Chad, do you wanna start? Well, I, I think I have one that you know, but um, you know, the department needs to commit to supporting you and your efforts to modernize this, the, the department. Um, it, you know, the Congress needs to support it. It has to invest to make it real. We can't, um, we can't Bubble, game, bubble gum and, and band-aid this thing together for much longer and and you know you've been working your tail off to try to get support and I fully support it. I, I think the nation certainly needs to to dedicate itself to the resources to make this uh, make these things real. Amen. I don't think you'll find anyone that disagrees in this room. Um, all right. So um, so I think I think we we've definitely talked a lot about. Um, funding and, and, and really closing that say-do gap, um, which uh, that, that really is the biggest part of our say-do gap right now, I think, is, is making sure that we have that consistent funding because I, I see our airmen and guardians and, and our PEOs deploying awesome capability every day, and then I see us continually not able to scale it just because it takes so long to get money into the palm. I think we all know that in this room. So I wanna, I wanna give you a, another chance. What's something else that maybe we, maybe that we don't know that you could throw in? So, so one thing I, I think, and, and again, you probably know this, you're, you're a very smart lady. Um, there's a lot of tech out there that could be in, in warfighters' hands today. Um, when I jumped to industry, I was actually somewhat frustrated with what I saw that we could be fielding today that we're just not. Um, and so finding ways to get things on contract and get things into warfighters' hands uh, to me is something that uh, I know, you, I know is pa you're passionate about and you'll keep your eye on it, but that's one thing I would like to stress. So I, I wanna dive in there a little bit. So, um, so we have RCO working some efforts, we have HN working some efforts. What do you think are the big things that, that those organizations need to do to really monopolize on this over the next year? 
So uh, RCO certainly has committed itself and, and the resources allotted to it to build the digital infrastructure, and I applaud that effort. I think that's the, the right first step. You can't, you can't hang drapes in the house before you, before you put the plumbing in. And so I think that's, that's great. I, I know HN is doing a lot of great work as well, and there's some tight partnerships that have probably not been so great in the past, but they are getting far stronger, I've, I've noticed, and, and that's something that should be encouraged because uh, two great performing organizations like that can do a lot if they, if they optimize the synergy between them. And I know that there's some work being done to, to enable that. Yeah, actually, I've been I've been really heartened over the last I don't know if it's the last six months, the last year, just how incredibly well the IT community and the cyber community writ large are coming together and sharing information and challenge each other and getting better and pooling funds and um, I think it's actually starting to work as a pretty effective bridge strategy. Um, so it, it's been pretty cool and I appreciate your partnership too. So Bob, same question: What's what are what are those biggest things that that I need to keep my eyes on over the next year? So, so I buried the lead earlier. I think one really big thing, and you already mentioned it, just pushing forward to uh, broader CDS solutions DOD-wide. So PATO CDS solutions to go both low to high and then redaction policy in place to be able to do high to low uh, are going to be critical for getting at JADC2 and getting at ABMS. Um, I, I'd say you, you also touched from the zero trust standpoint and how you can take some of what's already been done, right, whether it's the, uh, you know, the GCDS side of policy, global policy enforcement and policy decision points, the CNAP side that you mentioned, and the software-defined perimeter. How do we blend those two together to get the best of both worlds where you have maximum access to both uh, industry as well as non-traditional industry partners, right, that there's not necessarily a CAC barrier for entry to start adding value. Uh, or a SIPR token barrier for entry to start adding value uh, that will really open the aperture for who can contribute to the base. I, th I think that, coupled with the diode, will, will have the most dramatic impact. Right, cool. So I'll, I'll tell the team, row faster. <laughs> yeah, no, but we, it, I, I normally use the phrase holy war when I talk about CDSs. They, they really are way too complex within the department, and, and we understand why. I mean, there's a pretty big actual threat situation um, and a lot of abuse in the past, unfortunately, that we've maybe overzealously enforced as a result, um, but we, we do have some, some good folks on that. Um, I wanna ask you, so I, I won't tell you which company this was, but um, I had a, a large cloud provider that may or may not be in cloud one, um, make a bet with me that they could get over 100 apps migrated into cloud one in 30 days. Um, I, I'm ready to go to Vegas on that one and, and see if uh, see if the other uh, cloud providers can do too. Will, will you do this with me? Will we race to the cloud together? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. All right. We're going to call it Bespin too. All right. We'll, all right. We're going to get everybody to start line. Let's see how we'll, we'll see what happens. All right. Um, all right, Bill. I know I know you got something fun for this crowd. Um, what what do I need to keep my mind on? Well, I think the. I probably used my good one earlier, right, which is that, that gap for operational tests to get capability not, in, not into the lab, but out into the world. I think that's a pretty big thing. I think there are some remaining challenges, some significant challenges in scaling cloud technologies as realized in data centers out into all the environments where we need to put things because it's not just scaling down what we have, it's coming up with things that meet the right interfaces and the right form factors and the right security controls and, and all of that, so it's a consistent implementation across the whole spectrum. It's a pretty big deal, and it's, it's not just being able to take a thing I ran in the data center and run it in some other box. Sometimes it has to be a different thing in the other box. I have to decimate the, the neural network weights or whatever, but there, there has to be a pretty smart way of dealing with that, and I think it has to be dealt with systemically to make it scale and, and sustainable. All right, amen. Thank you, guys. We're, we only have about a minute left. I'm going to ask you a lightning round question. We're going to leave on a positive note, okay? Make us all feel really good about, uh, about the positive side of cyber and IT. So what, what are we doing really well right now? And, and you can even tell us what, what you're doing really well to help us. Uh, letting the Airmen and Guardians run is, is what you should be doing, and you're letting them do that, so I applaud that. <laughs> Uh, one thing that I see in the Air Force uh, as compared to other branches of military and federal civilian agencies uh, that you do really, really well is you 
go after economy of scale solutions in a way that the other branches and other government, solution, uh, government agencies are starting to see and model after. So, uh, you know, applaud the Air Force for their direction, both from an IT and cyber uh, workforce and how that's moving forward. And I, I'm very happy with what I'm seeing in terms of pushing open standards, advocating for open standards, and actually standing up consortium-based acquisitions so that it's not a cook-off amongst the primes. It's let's go find people who have content and then come up with the best solution, not just what we can get behind one prime. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I really appreciate all the comments. Um, we definitely have some really good things going on in the department. We have so much work to do, but I think we have the right people in place and the right things coming together to do it, um, which is why I'm still here pushing that rock. So really appreciate your partnership, really appreciate you all listening to us today. I have been asked to share with you that in lieu of speaker gifts this year, sorry guys, uh, AFA has made donations uh, for more Airmen and Guardians to be able to attend the barbecue, and I am supposed to plug the barbecue. Um, it'll be poolside, um, great food, I don't know, but it's been good in the past. Um, so hopefully we'll see you out there uh, this afternoon by the pool. Uh, and uh, right now in the foyer, you have a 30-minute coffee break with the next session starting at 3. So thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate it.